Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Regional Economic Conditions webinar. My name is Carmiana Matson. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And in just a moment, we'll be hearing from Joe Mann from our Regional Economics area of the bank. This is the third in our series of economic conditions webinars in the Ninth District. This is the end of this series, but we hope you'll join us for the next series, which will commence again in October when we have some new survey results. Today, Joe will be speaking to us for about 25 minutes. We will have about five minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If you do have questions as he is presenting, please locate the chat box that is at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. You can type your question in the chat box to all panelists, and I will moderate those questions as we have time. If we have a high number of questions, we may go just a little bit beyond 930, but we'll try to get you out of here on time. And as you close this webinar, we'd love to hear your feedback back on the webinar. Since it is part of a series, we'd like to hear what you think we should do going forward. There will be a pop-up survey in your browser window as you leave this Zoom webinar. With that, I am going to turn it over to Joe Mann. Thanks, Carmi, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to everyone in the audience for tuning in today. I'm going to be sharing with you some results that we just released at the beginning of this week uh, of an annual survey that we conduct of businesses in the services sector. And I'll get into those in just a moment. Uh, but a quick item of housekeeping, I just want to, uh, I just want to uh, give our standard disclaimer that any views I express are my own and uh, not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is an independent and nonpartisan institution. Of course, that doesn't mean that uh, all of us who work for the Fed don't have our own opinions, uh, but I just want to make it clear that, uh, but, but that my opinions are mine and not the Fed's. Uh, as Carmi mentioned, uh, this uh, today's presentation is part of a series that we're doing. Some of you in the audience may have tuned in for my colleague uh, Ron Wirtz's presentations in the last few weeks. Uh, it's an extension of our annual Regional Economic Conditions Conference, and we thought um, given the lack of in-person events and the sort of plethora of, of economic information that we're gathering and trying to share with the public uh, during this sort of unprecedented uh, economic contraction and, and, and pandemic that we're, that we're all experiencing right now, uh, that we would share some of this information on a more uh, ongoing basis. And so this is our attempt to kind of uh, get that information out to those of you. And again, as Carmi mentioned, stay tuned. Uh, we, will be having, um, we will be having some more of these events. Um, unlike the, uh, the, the information that my colleague Ron Wirtz has shared with you in the last couple of these presentations, the information that I'm going to share is kind of is part of an, uh, an annual survey that we've been doing for more than a decade now uh, at the Minneapolis Fed and the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. So what I'm going to be going through today, I, I'm not, I, we want to keep this event short, so I'm not going to get into a lot of information about the Fed and what we are and what we do and how we're structured, but I am going to talk a little bit about what our region is. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit more detail about the, the actual services sector that this survey covers before I get into the survey results themselves. And just to kind of give away the punchline for those of you uh, who might not be able to stay through the whole thing, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the respondents in the survey that we just conducted uh, have told us that uh, the sector is in contraction, uh, just like the rest of the economy. Um, uh, that's maybe not surprising. I think a little bit more newsworthy or more uh, informative is that their outlooks that we pull them on uh, are, are, are fairly, um, uh, fairly pessimistic as well. And I'll share some information on that. And again, it's not surprising given what we've seen uh, with the, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And because of that uh, pandemic, we had a couple of special questions that we asked about the impact specifically of COVID-19 on business conditions. And I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing uh, that information with you as well toward the end of this presentation. <clears throat> Um, so quick, uh, quick background just on, uh, I'll be talking a lot about the Ninth Federal Reserve District. So just to give you an understanding of what I mean by that, what is the region that we cover, you can see in this map of the Federal Reserve Districts that we are sort of the North Central United States. Our region covers Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, and then the Northwest portion of Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We're one of 12 Federal Reserve Districts. The Federal Reserve System uh, was designed in the early 20th century, uh, sort of unique among uh, central banks and that we're a decentralized central bank. Uh, this was done sort of for political reasons at that time to decentralize the decision-making power and make sure that it was representing the whole country. 
One of the benefits of having designed the system this way, though, is it requires us to gather economic information from all over the country in making national economic policy because the United States is a large diverse uh, economy and you don't want to necessarily be making policy for the whole country based on what's just happening in uh, part of the country on Wall Street or in Washington. Um, so that's sort of sort of one of the benefits of this decentralized structure. So I just want you to keep this in, uh, in, in mind as I'm talking about these results that these results are going to be covering this multi-state region that I just described the sort of North Central uh, United States. Um, and then on a sectoral basis, I want to get into a little bit more detail about the what I mean by the services sector. What are the businesses that we reached out to? So there's two kind of broad overarching categories. You can see them here. For those of you who are interested in the, uh, in the uh, national income and product accounts data, I'm referring to these NAICS codes uh, that you can see in parentheses there. These cover the uh, professional, scientific, and technical services and administrative support services. I'm not going to read through the whole list. What I want you to take away if you browse through these bullet point lists uh, that I've put up here is that this is a broad and diverse array of sorts of businesses that, that we're surveying. Everything from, from marketing and graphic design all the way to engineering and scientific research, and then also building security and cleaning, administrative support, clerical support. It's really a broad array of uh, business and professional services uh, that, are, that are captured in this category. And by the, and by the way, these, this is not in either of these cases an exhaustive list of the type of businesses. These are just some examples of the kinds of firms uh, that, that are included uh, in, in this survey. So it's a broad array of businesses and it's also a fairly large part of the economy. So in this chart here, you can see a breakdown of GDP, the gross domestic product produced in the United States and in these ninth district states um, by sector. And those pie slices that I've kind of pulled out here represent the size of these uh, of the, the services sectors that we're covering roughly in this survey. Uh, and, and what you can take away from this is that we're talking about roughly an eighth of the economy. It's a slightly larger share nationally than it is in the ninth district as a whole. If I were to show you the breakdown just from Minnesota, for those of you in the audience from Minnesota, it's a very similar share. But in both cases, uh, we're talking about roughly one eighth of the of, of uh, national economic output accounted for by these sectors. Quick note again for those of you who are are familiar with uh, some of the uh, some of the sectors in in the GDP breakdown. What I'm calling other services here is a broader category than what the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis usually refers to as other services. I've done this to keep the number of pie slices down. Uh, so this includes all the other service categories as well. Uh, things from food services and accommodation to IT and a bunch of other sectors that I've kind of lumped into that broad category, again, just to kind of pull those out. So, um, and the broader services category, including professional services and others, is, is roughly a third of the economy. Um, and what I want to show you next is what they account for in terms of employment. So I just showed you output, sort of the value of goods and services produced. Um, and it's a roughly similar share of the total labor force. Uh, and this is kind of sort of noteworthy that these two are equal, because if you look at some other sectors, uh, the, the, the share they account for of GDP and the share of employment could be quite different. So for example, financial services is a large share of, uh, of our output, relatively large, relatively small share of employment. Uh, manufacturing as well has a slightly larger share of output than employment, but it's roughly equal um, so both in the both in the case of the uh, the, the the value of uh, of goods and services produced by these businesses and also the number of people working for these firms uh, are roughly about we're talking about roughly about an eighth of the economy um, and it's a growing share over time so if I were to show you a, a chart of these percentages going back 50 years you would see that the size of uh, both this services sector and the broader services sector are increasing as a share of the economy over time it's becoming relatively relatively more important. Uh, Alan Greenspan, the former chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, not someone known for his pithy quotes, uh, once said that our GDP weighs less than it used to, to kind of emphasize the idea that uh, a larger share of our economy is devoted to services rather than, uh, than goods and, and mining and, and sort of traditional economic activities. Um, 
So it's a growing share of the economy over time. And, uh, and that sort of underscores why, uh, why we do this survey. We conduct this survey on an annual basis with our partners at the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, they survey firms in Minnesota. We survey firms, we at the Minneapolis Fed survey firms in our other district states, so the Dakotas, Montana, uh, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And the results that I'm gonna be showing you include the Minnesota uh, responses that we got from DEED. Uh, but as well as the response, respondents in the other states. Um, <clears throat> I, just wanna, I just wanna point out for those of you who, who, who listened to Ron Wirtz's presentations on some of his surveys, this is a little bit different than what he has presented in that um, this is, as I mentioned, an ongoing survey that we do on an annual basis. And this follows some of the sort of, um, the sort of uh, statistical uh, best practices, if you will. Um, we, we usually mail these surveys out. It's to a random sample of firms um, that we stratify by state and firm size. So we, the sample, we, have, we sample more firms from uh, the larger states. Most firms are very small. They have fewer than five employees. Um, so, so, so we sample, um, we try and get, be representative of large and small firms. Um, and one important difference this year than the way that we usually conduct this survey. I mentioned that we usually conduct this survey via mail survey. I think for obvious reasons, we decided this year that that wasn't practical to do because so many businesses are operating on, uh, on a work from home basis. We weren't really sure how many would actually receive the survey and mail it back. That made collecting it challenging. So we did, pull, we did conduct this survey online this year. Um, we got a slightly lower response rate than we usually get when we conduct this via mail survey, uh, but we got 236 respondents from an array of firms across the Ninth Federal Reserve District, so it's a fairly representative sample. <clears throat> and uh, again, perhaps unsurprisingly to get into some of the results, um, these firms told us that the last 12 months, oh, and I, one, one other thing that I should have mentioned um, is that since we conduct this survey in the middle of the year, we asked them, um, we asked them about the, the last 12 months of performance, so going back to mid-2019, and their expectations for the coming four quarters or 12 months, uh, so heading into mid-2021. So I just want you to keep those sort of time frames in mind because um, <clears throat> they're not sort of cleanly cut at the end of the calendar year. Um, so what's surprising given that is that, uh, is that even though most of these firms were experiencing growth through late 2019 and into early 2020 before the pandemic hit, the economic contraction uh, uh, that, that's associated with the pandemic kind of wiped all of those gains out. Um, and you can see that in this chart. So I've plotted here the results uh, based in, in, in what's called a diffusion index. So this is a way of summarizing the results. We asked these businesses, about things like their sales revenue, their profits, how many people are working at their firms. And um, we asked them whether those things increased, decreased, or were unchanged over the last year. And the uh, diffusion index is a way of summarizing that. So that solid uh, dark line in the middle of this chart at a value of 50, that's the cutoff point. Anything higher than that value indicates that on average, these firms told us that uh, those indicators were increasing. Anything to the left of that line tells us that on average, uh, they contracted or decreased. So what you can see is that for almost all of these indicators, these firms told us uh, that, they, that they had a down year, uh, particularly notable that sales were down, uh, but profits, productivity, employment, across the board. A couple notable things, the one that did increase, that they did report increase was input costs. So that's sort of doubly bad news if your sales are down and your cost of inputs has continued to increase. Um, and the other thing that is interesting and in contrast, strong contrast to recent years, is they told us that labor availability decreased. So something that we've been a repeated theme that we've seen uh, year after year in doing this survey since the end of the Great Recession has been that uh, firms have been telling us that it's harder and harder to find workers. Um, uh, and uh, and that's, sort of, that's sort of abated somewhat uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> so you might wonder, how do these results compare to what firms usually tell us? So I've plotted here uh, the, sort of the history of the survey going back to when we began conducting it in 2006. You'll notice a break in 2011. Uh, we didn't release the survey results that year. Um, and what I want you to take from this is two things. So this is, again, that diffusion index, that solid black line in the middle is the cutoff point between expansion and contraction. Um, so going back to the end of the Great Recession, back to, back to 2012, 
Uh, these firms have consistently been telling us that their sales were growing and that they were increasing employment um, <clears throat> at, their, uh, at, their, at their firms. Um, and so, um, and, uh, and, and so this comes, this contraction that we're seeing in 2020 really comes at the, uh, on the heels of, uh, of, of multiple years of growth. And these are some of the lowest responses in terms of the performance that we've seen uh, since the Great Recession. Now, we don't just ask them about what their firms saw over the past year. We also ask them about their, their outlook or their expectations for the coming year. So you can see that I've added that in this chart. These are their, their expectations for 2020 through the end of the year and through the middle of 2021. Um, and again, they're expecting continued contraction. Um, and again, this is noteworthy because we're not asking these firms in this question what they're expecting to happen in the broader economy. We're asking what they're planning to do with their business. Uh, so most firms are expecting through um, through the middle of uh, next year to see continued uh, decreases in sales, although a smaller portion of them did tell us that they expected decreases in sales than had seen uh, decreases in sales. So you could interpret that as a slightly less pessimistic than uh, the performance of the last year. Um, <clears throat> profitability, uh, again, across the board with the exception of input costs. Um, Slight, uh, slightly increased output outlook for labor availability, but it still remains kind of in, in, uh, in that decreasing ter territory and employment as well. And again, when we ask them about employment, we're asking them whether they're expecting to hire workers at their own firm, not whether they're expecting the headline level of national employment to change. We do ask about their overall economic expectations though, which I'll get into in a, in, in a moment. But again, I wanna show you what their outlook, uh, how their outlook compares to, uh, to what they usually tell us over the last few years. So a couple slides ago, I showed you the sort of backward looking history of, 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 the, uh, of this survey since we started conducting it. This is, this is the, the history of what uh, respondents' outlooks were. And what you can see from this is that, um, particularly for sales revenue, even during um, even during the financial crisis and Great Recession, these firms retained a certain amount of optimism about, uh, about the coming year. Um, employment dipped into negative territory in 2009, but recovered the following year. Um, and so what we're actually seeing this year is that we got really the lowest level of optimism for sales and employment uh, than we've seen in the history of the survey. It's still uh, it's still fairly close to that growth neutral territory, but it is, but it's, but it's dipped into the, the, the contraction range for the survey. So firms um, on, on, on balance are, are pessimistic about their sales and about their employment levels over the coming year and, uh, and more so than they've been uh, in the past. <clears throat> we also asked them, as I mentioned, about their expectations for the overall economy. And here I'm comparing their outlook uh, from this year to their outlook from a year ago. So this is from the survey results last year that you're seeing in the, that kind of sea green uh, bar there compared to the gold bar, which is what they told us in our most recent survey as their outlook. And generally speaking, pessimistic, their level of pessimism uh, for, the for, the, for the overall economy is actually maybe a little less than for their own firms. Um, but you can see, uh, and apologies that it looks like that uh, the, the, the cutoff line for the diffusion index is slightly, uh, slightly off center there. Um, <clears throat> it should be a little to the left, but uh, what, you can, what you can take away from this is that again, across the board, firms are expecting at the state level for employment in their states to decrease over the coming, uh, over the coming 12 months uh, through the end of 2020 and into 2021. Uh, they're also expecting decreases in consumer spending. And again, in contrast to last year when they told us that on balance they were expecting growth in 2020. And of course, um, usually what's noteworthy about these expectations is that they do tend to dip prior to recessions um, and, uh, and they didn't in 2019. So firms were fairly optimistic going into late 2019 and into 2020. Of course, no one at the time that we conducted this survey last year could have seen the uh, could have seen this sort of global pandemic and the impact that it would have on business due to shutdowns and due to uh, people pulling back on their consumer spending activity um, and all the consequences of that. So that sort of underscores the sort of hazards of economic forecasting. You really can't predict the unpredictable. Um, <clears throat> 
but uh, but 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 it also does underscore that a lot of the a lot of the responses that we saw, and this is true. Also, um, if you look at the comments that we got in response to the survey, so we ask uh, these firms to fill out kind of a multiple choice questionnaire about their business expectations, but we also give them the opportunity to just uh, fill in open comments. And a lot of the comments that we got uh, were to the effect that um, that most of the negative uh, uh, activity, mo- m- 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 the biggest negative effect on their business is due to the pandemic uh, rather than to other economic factors, which is again, maybe not surprising. Because of that, um, we, we, we put a couple of sort of one-time special questions on this year's survey about the impact of the pandemic. And you can see one of these uh, basically just asked directly, what, is, what has been the impact of uh, COVID-19 on your business? And we asked for sort of an array of different, um, uh, different categories, whether or not it, they saw an increase or a decrease or no change at all. Um, what's noteworthy in this, I'll leave it up for a minute here so you can uh, kind of digest it, but all this information, uh, by the way, is available on our website at MinneapolisFed.org and also in the uh, Minnesota deed release for Minnesota. Um, what's noteworthy here is that a lot of firms telling us that, that uh, revenue decreased, that cash availability decreased. Um, so, so 57% of firms reported that they saw their revenues decrease as a result of COVID-19. Um, 50% of firms told us that they saw a decrease in employee productivity uh, as a result of COVID-19. And uh, that's perhaps tied to one of the largest, the largest increase category we had, uh, which was for employees working from home. Uh, So 63% of firms told us that they saw an increase in employees working from home. Again, not surprising given uh, everything we know about what's happening during the pandemic. So, uh, so, so, so uh, nearly two thirds of firms uh, increased the uh, the increased remote work activity. Um, sort of, if you look off to the right there, kind of in the category of no news being good news, the majority of firms that we asked about whether or not they've missed loan payments or rent payments have told us that they haven't, uh, or that there's been no change due at least to the pandemic in uh, their rent payments or in loan payments. Um, <clears throat> Slightly more than 40% of firms told us that they had requested financial assistance, um, likely through the, the, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program or some of the other CARES Act programs um, due to the, co- the, the pandemic. Uh, but perhaps surprisingly, about a third of firms told us that they hadn't requested financial uh, assistance. <clears throat> So this gets into kind of the last uh, question, going back to sort of outlook uh, and uh, and its relation to the pandemic. We asked businesses, how long do they think it'll be before their operations go back to normal, whatever normal means, uh, into uh, to pre-pandemic levels? And nearly half of businesses that we surveyed told us that they thought it would be uh, more than six months before their business operations went back to normal. Now we know that a lot of this outlook is contingent on the course of the virus, whether or not uh, whether or not a vaccine or some other effective treatment is developed. Um, we don't expect these businesses to be experts in epidemiology um, or immunology, but uh, but they are experts in their own businesses, and what they're telling us is. Uh, they certainly don't expect before the end of the year and into t- early 2021 uh, that they're going to see uh, something like normal conditions again. Um, what is interesting is 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 uh, slightly more than a sixth of them uh, told us that uh, that they that there that there's been uh, a, 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 that they're that they're that they're not expecting their business to go back to normal. So they think that there's going to be a permanent change. We don't really know what's sort of underlying that response, whether they're going to continue having people work from home on a permanent basis. Um, but certainly a lot of businesses planning for some of the changes that they've made to be permanent. Um, 11% told us, though, that there's been no effect on their business, and uh, only 2% said that they're going out of business as a result of the pandemic. But the majority, or rather the plurality of businesses, the largest share for and fall in that category of not expecting things to go back to normal for, uh, for, for more than six months. Uh, so that kind of is a quick rundown of the results of this survey. Again, you can, you can read more about them on our webpage, MinneapolisFed.org. We also have a, a COVID dashboard of economic indicators that we've put up 
to sort of track the ongoing pandemic and the impacts on the economy. And uh, we have a few minutes left for questions, and I'll and I'll and I'll uh, I'll close my mouth and start taking those. But I do want to mention for anybody who doesn't have an opportunity uh, to ask a question uh, or have their question asked during this session, please feel free to reach out to me via email or or on LinkedIn, and I have my email address up on this screen. Thank you. With that, we will open it up for questions for Joe. If you can locate the chat box that is at the bottom of your screen, you can type a question in the chat box. And Joe, there was a question earlier in your presentation on how it is that input costs are expanding for so many of these firms when their labor is actually contracting. So that's a good question. Um, these are specifically, so we, one, actually one, one result that I haven't shown you uh, in, in these results, and again, you can, you can read about them on our webpage, um, uh, is we asked them specifically about wages and benefits. So the input costs that we're asking them about in this question are specifically non-labor input costs. So uh, that would be things like uh, rent. I think in this case, what you're seeing driving this is probably uh, the additional costs that firms have had to take on in order to facilitate more employees working from home, personal protective equipment and things of that nature. Uh, so not direct labor input costs. But yeah, you, you raise a good point, whoever it was that rose that question, that if firms are cutting employees, that should decrease their overall, uh, some of their overall input costs at least. Um, uh, but so these are specifically non-labor input costs. And again, I wanna, I, I, I've sort of posited uh, an explanation that this is maybe due to the um, uh, increased remote work. We don't really know uh, though, without um, without talking to firms directly, because these are just their responses on a multiple choice question. We don't, we can't really see inside sort of the black box of why they responded that way. So that sort of underscores uh, how myself and my colleagues, a lot of the work that we do is going out and interfacing with businesses and uh, and having uh, qu conversations about these kind of qualitative things that you don't necessarily capture in in uh, a multiple choice question. And Joe, with all the pessimism, why have real estate prices increased so much in 2020? So that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, I, th I think that uh, the, what we're seeing in terms of real estate prices, I'm guessing the questioner is probably referring to residential real estate. So the housing market, housing market continues to be hot. Uh, and one thing that I think is certainly driving that is the fact that interest rates are very low. It's, um, it's still very inexpensive to get a mortgage and to finance a house. Um, people are spending more time at home and so they're investing more into their houses. But it has been an interesting thing throughout this pandemic that probably the strongest sector that we've seen uh, has, been, has been real estate. I think the, um, the it certainly, or at least again, I wanna distinguish residential real estate from commercial real estate. And my colleague, Ron Wirtz could talk more about the, the, the detail there because he follows that sector more closely. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the, real est the residential real estate industry as a whole has managed to adapt pretty well and continue uh, selling homes and hosting showings um, via sight unseen, even during the pandemic. And Joe, there is a question about the types of firms that you're surveying, insurance, financial institutions. Could you talk a little bit more about what is included in that category and what is not? Yeah, more. So you mentioned actually two that are not included. So uh, just to go back to uh, if you look at the breakdown of the sectors here. So these are professional and business services, finance, insurance and real estate, financial services, banking. That's kind of a separate category. Uh, of services that we didn't include in this survey. Uh, so these are just firms that are in that kind of um, administrative support, um, consulting, legal services, architecture and design, things like that. Um, we're also not including, there's, there's some other really important service categories that aren't included in here in particular, a lot of the person to person services like dining and accommodation, and then also really importantly, health and education services, very large share of the economy not included in this survey because it's sort of its own separate sector. Uh, there was a, an attendee who is surprised by the employee productivity levels that with so many folks working from home, the impression is that that should increase productivity rather than decrease. Yeah, I found that surprising as well because as I've heard anecdotally from a lot of firms that their productivity has held up pretty well, even though they've gone to uh, remote working environments. Now, what I've heard a lot, though, is that our productivity is not down as much as we thought it might be. 
I think we all know anyone who's anyone who's had to manage the challenge of working from home, especially if you have small children, uh, know that it can be sort of difficult to sort of uh, to focus on work during normal business hours. Um, again, particularly with small children. Um, so I think that I think that you know again just just to trying to square these results. Uh, with what I've with what I've heard from businesses anecdotally, what I'm guessing is that most that most of them have in mind is that um, their productivity is down, but not down maybe as much as they might have expected if they'd had to just automatically send everyone home to work. Great. Thanks, Joe. It looks like we have made it through all of the questions in the chat box, so we will wrap this up. We will be sending a follow-up email to all registered attendees that will have a link to the recorded version of this webinar, as well as a link to Joe's slides, if you'd like some more detail on those. And we'll also include with that information on our next webinar in the Regional Economic Conditions series, which will be on general businesses and our next survey results from them. Thanks so much for joining us today.